Among other things, they were unable to complete their supply forces from a band of Sh the Cheyenne Indians. On the 6th of August, the journey was resumed, and they soon left the hostile region of the Sioux behind them. About this period, a plot was discovered on the part of the interpreter, Edward Rose. This villain had been tampering with the men and proposed upon arriving among his old acquaintances, the Crows, to desert the, to the savages with as much booty as could be carried off. The matter was adjusted, however, and Mr. Rose, through the ingenuity of Mr. Hunt, quietly dismissed. On the 13th, Mr. H varied his course to the westward, a route which soon brought him to a fork of Little Missouri. And upon the skirts of the Black Mountains, these are an extensive chain, lying about 100 miles east of the Rocky Mountains, stretching northeasterly from the south fork of the River Platte to the great north bend of the Missouri, and dividing the waters of the Missouri from those of the Mississippi and the Arkansas. The travelers here supposed themselves to be about 250 miles from the village of the Arikaras. Their more serious troubles now commenced. Hunger and thirst, and with the minor difficulties of grizzly bears, beset them at every other turn. As they attempted to force a passage through the rugged barriers of the path, at length they emerged upon a stream of clear water. One of the forks of the Powder River. And once more beheld the wide meadows and plenty of buffalo. They ascended this stream about 18 miles, directing their march toward a lofty mountain, which had been in sight since the 17th. They reached the base of this mountain, which proved to be a spur of the rocky chain, on the 13th, on the 30th, having now come about 400 miles since leaving Arikara. For one or two days, they endeavored to, in vain to find a defile in the mountains. On the 3rd of September, they made an attempt to force a passage to the westward, but soon became entangled among rocks and precipices, which set all their efforts at defiance. They were now, too, in the region of the terrible Apsarokas, and encountered them at every step. They met with also with friendly bands of Shoshones and Flatheads. After a thousand troubles, they made some way upon their journey. On the night, they reached Wind River, a stream which gives its name to the a range of mountains consisting of three parallel chains, 80 miles long and about 25 abroad. One of its peaks, says the author, is probably 15,000 feet above the level of the sea. For five days, Mr. Hunt followed up the course of the Wind River, crossing and recrossing it. He had been assured by the three hunters who advised him to strike through the wilderness that by going up the river and crossing a single mountain ridge, he would come upon the headwaters of the Columbia. The scarcity of game, however, determined to pursue a different course. In the course of the day after coming to this resolve, they reached, they perceived three mountain peaks, white with snow, and which were recognized by the hunters as rising just above a fork on the, of the Columbia. These peaks were named the Pilot Knobs by Mr. Hunt.
travelers continued their course for about 40 miles to the southwest and at length found a river flowing to the west. This proved to be a branch of the Colorado. They followed its current for 15 miles. On the 18th, abandoning its main course, it took a northwesterly direction for 8 miles and reached one of its little tributaries, issuing from a bosom of the mountains. And running through green meadows abounding in buffalo. Here they encamped for several days, and a little repose being necessary for both men and horses. On the 24th, the journey was resumed. 15 miles brought them to a stream about 50, miles, 50 feet wide, was, which was recognized as one of the headwaters of the Columbia. They kept along it for two days, during which it gradually swelled in a river of some size. At length it was joined by another current, and both united swept off and up in an unimpeded stream, which from its rep rapidity and turbulence had received the appellation of Mad River. Down this, they anticipated an uninterrupted voyage in canoes to the point of their ultimate destination. But their hopes were far from being realized. The partners had a consultation. Three hunters who had hitherto acted as guides knew nothing of the region to the west of the Rocky Mountains. It was doubtful whether Mad River could be navigated, and they could hardly resolve to abandon their horses upon an uncertainty. The boat, nevertheless, was for embarkation, and they proceeded to build the necessary vessels. In the meantime, Mr. Hunt, having now reached the headwaters of the Columbia, reputed to abound in beaver, turned his thoughts to the main object of the expedition. Four men, Alexander Carson, Louis St. Michel, Pierre Dete, and Pierre Dulaunay were detached from the expedition to remain and trap beaver by themselves in the wilderness. Having collected a sufficient quantity of some peltries, they were to bring them to the depot at the mouth of the Columbia or to some intermediate post to be established by the company. These trappers had just departed when two snake Indians wandered into the camp and declared the river to be unnavigable. Scouts sent, were sent out by Mr. Hunt finally confirmed his report. On the 4th of October, therefore, the encampment was broken up and the party proceeded to search for a post in possession of Missouri fur company. It's said to be somewhere in the neighborhood upon the banks of the, another branch of the Columbia. This post they found without much difficulty. It was deserted and our travelers gladly took possession of the rude buildings. The stream here we found was upward of a hundred wide, hundred yards wide. Canoes were con constructed con constructed with all these dispatch. In the meantime, another detachment of trappers was, was cast loose in the wilderness. These were Robinson, Resner, Hoback, Carr, and Mr. Joseph Miller. This latter, it will be remembered, was one of the partners. He threw up a share in the, in the expedition, however, for a life of more perilous adventure. On the 18th of the month, October, Fifteen canoes were being completed. The voyagers embarked, leaving their horses in charge of the two snakes, Indians. 
we're still in company. In the course of the day, the party arrived at the junction of, of the stream upon which they floated with Mad River. Here, Snake River commences the scene of a thousand disasters. After proceeding in about 400 miles, the means of frequent portages and beset with innumerable difficulties of every kind. The adventurers were brought to a halt by a series of frightful cataracts, raging as far as the eye could reach between stupendous ramparts of black rock, rising more than 200 feet per perpendicularly. This place they called the Cauldron Lynn. And here, Antoine Clampin, one of the voyagers, perished amid the whirlpools. Three of the canoes struck immovably among the rocks, and one was swept away with the weapons and effects of four of the boatmen. The situation in the party now was now lamentable indeed in the heart of an unknown wilderness, at a loss what route to take ignorant of their dis distance from the place of their destination, and with no human being near them for whom counsel might be taken. Their stock of provisions was reduced to five days' allowance, and famine stared them in the face. It was therefore more perilous to keep together than separate. The goods and provisions, except a small supply for each man, were concealed in caches, holes dug in the earth, and the party were divided into several small detachments, which started off in different directions, keeping the mouth of the Columbia in view as their ultimate point of death destination. From this post, they were dis still distant nearly a thousand miles, although this fact was unknown to them at the time. On the 21st of January, after a series of almost incredible adventures, the division of, in which Mr. Hunt enrolled himself struck the waters of the Columbia, some distance between, below the junction of its two great branches, Lewis and Clark Rivers, and not far from the influx of the Walla Walla. Since leaving the Cauldron Wind, they had toiled 240 miles through snowy wastes and precipitous mountains. And six months had now elapsed since their departure from the Eureka village on the Missouri. Their whole route from that point, according to their computation, having been 1,751 miles. Some vague intelligence was now received in regard to the other division of the party, and also the settlers at the mouth of the Columbia. On the 31st, Mr. Hunt reached the falls of the river and encamped at the village of the Wishwam. Here were heard tidings of the massacre upon, on the board of Tonquin. On the 5th of February, having procured canoes with much difficulty, the adventurers departed from Wishram on the 15th, sweeping around an intervening cape. They came in sight of the long-desired Astoria. Among the first to greet them on the landing were some of their old comrades who had de departed from them at the Cauldron Inn and who had reached the settlement nearly a month before. Mr. Crooks and John Day, being unable to get this to get on, had been left with some Indians in the wilderness. They afterward came in. Carrier, a voyager, who had been also, who's also abandoned through a sternest necessity, was never heard of more. 